Good morning, everyone. The recording is started. Uh, even before we could begin with our session, I would request one of us to please lead us in prayer. Can I request Aradhana? Aradhana, can you pray? Okay. Okay. Roslyn, are you in a position to pray? Am I audible? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, Paul, can you please pray? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you yet for another week. Thank you for being a good Lord. We have been our keeper. Thank you, Father, as we are going to hear your word. We pray that, Lord, it enters into your, our heart, our mind. We pray that, Lord God, you strengthen that, you revive us through your word so that you spread your word to the whole world. We pray and believe all this in Jesus Christ's name, Son of the living God. Amen. 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 So, yes. So, last week we studied on 1 Corinthians and today we're going to study on 2 Corinthians. So, even before I could start, let me project a slide. Yes. Yeah, we are able to see it. Okay, so good morning once again. Let's begin uh, this class on the second letter of Corinthians. So do we know how many letters did Paul write? We know the author, right? From last class, we know who's the author of this letter. It's Apostle Paul. And... How many letters did Paul write to the Church of Corinthians? Yes, Brother Lubega, please go ahead. I think it is more than two. There must be in four, five, and more, but I can only say that the answer is more than two letters. Yes. Yes, good. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Lubega. That's right. It is definitely more than two letters. Anyone else would like to add, like, what happened to the other letters? Okay. <clears throat> Even before we could come to the letters, Okay, I would like to share something on soteriological epistle. What is this? In, in the book of 1 Corinthians, we see it notable for its insistence that the cross of Christ is the instrument of sanctification. I'm just giving a little bit background of the previous letter so that we'll understand as we study on the second letter of the book of Corinthians. So in basic solution is uh, the moral issue of life. So while Romans and Galatians emphasized on the truth of justification is by faith in Christ, and the first Corinthians was written to remind the believers that though they once had been spiritually and morally bankrupt, now they are washed and sanctified and justified by the blood of Jesus, by the work that Jesus did on the cross. So it is not by what they are doing. It's not by the work, but by the grace of God. We see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 11. So whatever they ate or drank, whatever they did, they were to do all for the glory of God. So what is this doctrine of soteriology? What is the study all about? Well, when we see 
it is a branch of theology which deals with the study of salvation so soterio it is a greek word soterian in greek means salvation so it's related to soter means savior so soteriology relates to several other branches of theology so in that it asks uh, something like they do a deep study they have a deep study of you know uh, who is saved by whom for what and by what means so there is uh, you know a deep study that goes on into this particular stream so in first corinthians it is notable for its persistence on the study of salvation and what was the theme of first corinthians letter what was the theme please refer to your notes at least let's take this opportunity to refer so that the, more... the local church exactly good good uh, thanks zeli so to bring an order in the local church so what is the theme in the second corinthians in the letter to second corinthians the true gospel ministry for christ yes the true gospel ministry for christ so keeping in this mind let's look into how many letters did paul write so when we go through the scholars say that paul had written about four letters to the corinthian church and it was a it was written approximately in 56 to 57 ad about 6 months after paul wrote the first letter of first corinthians so the first letter which dealt with the problem of fornication in the church which has been noted in first corinthians chapter 5 9 and then that letter has been lost and the second letter that is the first corinthians which we have recorded in our bible in our scripture deals with the various problems he had become aware of in the church so that is what we have as first corinthians in the third paul writes another letter that's a third letter to the church of corinth that was pretty harsh and disciplinary in nature and this letter has also been lost but some scholars say there's stress or you know a, a portion of the letter has been preserved in the second corinthians in chapter 6 and 7 and then we also see the leading for paul to write the fourth letter which he comforted those who had uh, gotten themselves right with god and strongly he defended his apostleship against some who were op opposing his authority so that the fourth letter is what we have recorded as second corinthians so totally the scholars say that paul had written four letters first one was lost second one is what we have as first corinthians third one is also lost but a portion of that letter is preserved in the second corinthians in chapter 6 and of the first half of chapter 7 and the fourth letter is what we have as second corinthians okay is that clear to us okay keeping that in our mind let's look at the background of this place of corinth i know we discussed this last week just to brush up our knowledge so that we remember well corinth was the capital of the province of achaia that is greece its strategic location made it a point where all trader trade routes met in this place and so it would appeal to paul as an ideal center for which the gospel could spread or could be shared so commercially when we look at this place because of its position corinth became one of the greatest trading and a commercial center of its day so all traffic from the north to south of greece went through corinth which made it very prosperous yes keeping the business uh, or the commercial uh, uh, 
place, we also see the religious aspect of this or the morality of the people. It was very wicked in city, noted for its evil and immoral lifestyle. So the expression of the Corinthians, when they say uh, Corinthianize, is meant to live with drunkenness and immorality. This was the lifestyle of the Corinthians who lived in those days. And it was also known, this place was also known for the temple of Aphrodite was there, which had about 1,000 temple prostitutes. And the scholars also say that it was the Sodom of those days. This place, Corinth, was known as the Sodom of those days, full of sin, full of wicked thing happening there. They were known for that lifestyle. And look at the place where Paul has uh, uh, chosen to carry the gospel and go to this place to share the good news that even if you believe in Jesus as a Lord and Savior, you have an eternal life. He has carried the gospel and went into a place which was called as Sodom of those days or the city was so much filled with wicked and immoral lifestyle. And here we see a man with a great passion carrying the gospel of Jesus Christ and entering into the city. Now, he, definitely there would be a great opposition from the enemy and also from the people. And also we see Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. He says... Um, you know, I'm carrying this letter to them so that, you know, the, so that each one can receive this gospel, can receive this good news and be saved. So as we're going to study further, we should know who's the recipient of this letter. Who's the recipient of this letter? Church, the church at Collins. Yes, you're right. The Church of Corinth. Okay, I'll go to the next slide. Okay. So what we're going to study here, there are about 13 chapters. The first chapter, uh, chapter 1 to chapter 7, uh, talks about the crucial concerns. Crucial concerns, suffering and God's comfort, new covenant ministry, preserving and godliness. We also see there are some issues in the church has been addressed in chapter 1 to chapter 7. What is that? Mis misunderstanding, concerns, explanations. And here we also see Paul's tone of, as he writes this letter. He's asking them to be more forgiving, more grateful. As he mentions all that, he's also mentioning with an authority, with boldness. And in chapter 8 to chapter 9, we see the grace giving. Example of Macedonia, command to the Corinthians. And it talks about some of the issues that they had about the financial project, financial need. And then he confidently writes to them, addresses those issues. And then lastly, in chapter 10 to 13, we see the apostolic authority that he carried with the, uh, you know, and he, he tries to defend his apostleship. He replies to the critics of the people who came against him, the false teachers. And he also justifies the ministry that he is carrying. And he, he talks about the vision, the revelation, the credentials and the warning. And God's power has been perfected in the weakness. So it was not easy for Paul to face the people. Yes, he had a lot of oppositions and many other areas. But then with all that, he presents the gospel. He defends the gospel with strong and with boldness. There are some key verses, verse 4 to 5 and 9, uh, uh, chapter 4, verse 5, 
uh, can I request one of us to please turn to chapter 4, verse 5, and the other can turn to chapter 9, verse 7, and the next person can turn to chapter 10, verse 8, please. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your born servants, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Next person. So Paul says in 4 5 that for we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your born servant, for Christ's sake. So this was the key verse for which Paul carried scripture to the church of Corinthians. And can I request one of you all to please turn to chapter 9 verse 7. Second Corinthians chapter 9 verse 7. So let each one give us, give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. So as he's been, uh, he's encouraging the church to be a cheerful giver. So here we see that Paul talking about the financial need and he's telling, let each one give as he proposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. Give out of love. Don't have to push yourself. But then just give it, give to God because he has blessed you, he has given you so that you may receive the abundant blessing of that very act of giving. The next verse, chapter 10, verse 8, please. Chapter 10, verse 8. For even if I should boost, boast somewhat more about our authority, which the Lord gave us for edification and not for your destruction, I shall not be ashamed. Amen. Amen. So it says, for even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority, which the Lord gave us for edification and not for your destruction, I shall not be ashamed. Amen. Thank you. That was the authority that Paul carried with which he carried the gospel to the Corinthians church. So with that, I'll stop presenting this and we'll go back to our notes. Just give me a, a second, please. So what was the what was the reason for the second uh, for the second Corinthians for the letter of this second Corinthians to be written by Paul what may be the reason yes please go ahead I think he was happy oh, with the report. You know, the first letter was given to Timothy and the second letter was given, I mean, the third letter was given to Titus. So he was happy about the report that Titus told him in Macedonia, how they had reacted to the second, to the third letter, which we don't have. So I think he was, it was out of happiness. Yes, you're right. Yes, even the letter says that. So it was a follow-up to the first letter, most likely, which was written in Macedonia. And as Brother Lubega said, it was just a follow-up of the letter that was lost. But then we see that uh, he was very grateful. And Paul was waiting, perhaps, as much as a year to hear from them, hear from the local church. And then uh, he had responded to his previous letter. And he also most likely made a short trip in the meantime, that's what the scholars say. He would have made a short trip um, in the meantime uh, to correct some of the problem in the Corinthian church. And many of the problems had improved by now. 
and he gives praise to God for that. And he would also uh, like to address the new threats that had risen from the Judaizers. And uh, in response to that report, to the infiltration of some false teachers and false teaching that was arising, uh, which was seemed to be a common experience for Paul those days because some false teachers had come behind him and they were teaching uh, other than what Paul was teaching them, a different gospel, a different gospel. And in order to establish themselves and their teaching, they had to try to uh, undermine the authority or uh, bring down the reputation of Paul in the church. So the the, the Judaistic party had attacked Paul's apostleship, his leadership on several grounds. And they accused him in different areas. We see in, uh, yeah, first, uh, can I request one of you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 16 to 18. Sorry, yeah, chapter 1. Verse 16 to 18. To pass by way of you to Macedonia, to come again from Macedonia to you, and be helped by you on my way to Judea. Therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly? All the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh? that with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no. But as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. Should Amen. I continue now? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks. Thanks, Ruslan. So we see how Paul was accused, and he's giving an explanation, and they accused Paul of not preaching the whole gospel because of his lack of emphasis on work. We see that in chapter 4. Can I request one of you to turn to chapter 4, verse 1 to 6? Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received the mercy, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness or handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commanding ourselves to every man is conscious in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the whole, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your bound servants, for Christ is sake. For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the Amen. 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 So well, Paul is explaining, he's preaching the gospel. And also in the in the same letter in chapter 12, he says they accused him of not being a real apostle. And also these Ju uh, Judaistic party, they accused him of being pride and boast, boastful. They even attacked his personal appearance uh, of the manner of his speech as being less than impressive or even compatible. They, uh, that's the reason we see that. Can I request one of you all to turn to chapter 5, verse 12? Chapter 5, verse 12, we see for what Paul is defending and giving an answer of. Can I request one of you all to turn to chapter 5, verse 12? 
for we do not commend ourselves again to you but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart and chapter 10 verse 7 to 11 Yeah, Roslyn, you can read. Do you from... look at things according to the outward appearance? If anyone is convinced in himself that he is Christ, let him again consider this in himself that just as he is Christ, even so we are Christ. For even if I should boast some, somewhat more about our authority which the Lord gave us for edification, and not for your destruction. I shall not be ashamed lest I seem to terrify you by letters for his letters they say are weighty and powerful but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible let such a person consider this that what we are in word by letters when we are absent such we will also be in deed when we are present amen thank you so very clearly when we read the gospel he says that i do not come with uh, you know um, eloquent speech okay i do not come with eloquent speech but you know i come with simple words the gospel i come to you with gospel and uh, he, he shows about his simplicity and and he also uh, defends his apostleship yeah and we also see he was uh, it was a defense of his right to speak into the life of church uh in in chapter 1 verse 12 and also in chapter 2 verse verse 4 we see that paul explained why he had changed his plans for coming to them because they accused him these judaizers party accused him for saying he said he's coming but then he didn't come so he does not keep his word so here we see paul explains to them he says why he had to change his plans for coming to them and also he says um paul felt the need to vindicate his apostleship against the false charges which uh, you know uh, the leaders uh, the false teachers away bringing against paul so that the people may not receive the gospel that paul was sharing so paul used this uh, uh, uh in in uh, yeah so paul used his suffering in the ministry as a primary proof of his motives in the ministry is been very clear so with that we will also see what was the main theme in this letter main theme in this letter ali toli said what was the main theme in this letter the true gospel ministry of christ so we see that paul reaffirms some of the previous admonitions here in this letter he tries to defend his apostleship and he answers the charges that come against him for what all for the sake of the church that he is trying to establish at the place called corinth so paul represents a message of reconciliation we see that in second corinthians chapter 5 can i request one of you all to please turn to chapter 5 verse 18 to 20 now all things are of god who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation that is that god was in christ reconciling the world to himself not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation now then we are ambassadors for christ as though god were pleading through us we implore you on christ's behalf be reconciled to god for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of god in him amen thank you thank you roslyn so we see three things here reconciliation of the world 
back to God. And second, we see reconciliation of church back to himself. And the third, we see reconciliation of the repentant man to the church family, which is very important. And with that, he also uh, says, Paul, um, or as the weakness of a man as opposed to the power of God. How? In, uh, in, uh, in chapter 12, verse 9, he says, verse 9, I'll read from verse 7 onwards, which talks about the thorn in the flesh. So even before we could read, what do you think this thorn in the flesh would be? What is that Paul representing the thorn in the flesh as? Ma'am, the abundance of revelations that he received from Christ. Okay. The thorn in the flesh, something that is opposing him, what is it? You all tell me. Brother Lubega, Brother Subhashish, John, Nikki, please go ahead. Jeffina. Like, I, I just think that it may be, it means passing through some pain which you cannot get off, uh, that can't go off right away. Something that you are compared to do something, though it is painful to you. Let me stop it and leave it there. Anyone else? What is this thorn in the flesh that Paul talks about? We'll read the verse maybe. After that, we'll get an idea. Can I request one of you all to read from chapter 7, uh, sorry, chapter 12, verse 7 to 10? And least I should be exalted about above measure by the abundance of revelations. A thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning these things, I pleaded with the Lord three times that I might depart, that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient to you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in need, in persecution, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Amen. What a promise, isn't it? When I'm weak, then I'm strong. So we don't have to worry about our weaknesses because that is the area where God is going to glorify himself in our weaknesses. That's the uh, reason when God comforts um, Paul about the thorn in the flesh. Okay, so before we could move on to verse 9, I would request what is this thorn in the flesh that Paul is talking about in verse 7. Yes, we are not doing a verse-to-verse -verse study. Um, yes, we will be studying in detail verse-to-verse -verse in our third year, okay? Uh, but then I just thought on this one particular verse we can ponder a little bit on. That may help us. Anyone? That's okay. Just feel free because there is no perfect answer anywhere. So you can just feel free to share your thought. That will definitely help each one of us in the class. I think it refers to the hardship that we go through in the in, in ministry. Yes, yes, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to add to what brother Paul said? Uh, uh, is it the people who are trying to inflict the law of circumcision upon the Gentiles, uh, converts, and believers? So you mean to say the Judaizers who were opposing him in many ways against yeah, yeah. him? Okay, yes. 
Anyone else? Thank you, Zeli. Anyone else? Okay, so what we see here is uh, Paul has explained his vision and revelation in the first few verses in chapter 12. And then he tells them about the thorn in the flesh that has been given to him in verse 7. And apparently the very purpose of this thorn was, uh, yes, that's what he's saying. It benefits him because in verse 7 he says, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. So what happened? It could be anything. It could be the opposition from the Judaizers, the false teachers who were opposing him. Or it could be some kind of weakness in his, uh, some kind of infirmity that he was uh, going through in his body. Or it could be the opposition from the Satan. That's stopping the gospel from not spreading. Because keeping the background of this Corinth church that we just studied, it was known for its sinful, um, immoral lifestyle. Just imagine Paul carrying the gospel to a place which is filled with darkness. Imagine there would be so much of opposition for the good news. For the good news. And here we see Paul seeking God. Paul prayed three times, pleading with the Lord. And Lord gave him a reply saying that my grace is sufficient for you for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Yes, we see Paul been defending his apostleship, all that is there, but one man against many. You see, one man against many. But then God is saying he's strengthening Paul. Paul, don't give up. Don't look at your weakness. I'm greater than that. My grace is sufficient for you. Go on. Keep doing what you're doing. Leave the result to me. Don't worry about how many people may be op opposing you. Don't worry about the things that are coming against you. Don't worry if it is an infirmity. Don't worry about it. Whatever the thorn in the flesh he's talking about. But see, one thing that we know is scripture needs to interpret scripture. When we see about uh, in the Old Testament, in Numbers 33, verse 55, here we see the thorn is, is used as a metaphor for the enemies of the Israelites. So some scholars say it could be the false teachers or the Judaizers who were trying to oppose. This is what Paul was addressing for. And some other scholars say different way. So, yeah. So despite what could be the reason, but what we need to know in general is there was an opposition that Paul faced. Now today in, uh, in our class, as we are listening to this scripture, we may have opposition in different ways. We may face different challenges, despite our challenges, despite the opposition from a man or from the enemy or from any kind of infirmity. What should be focused on? Focus on the Lord. Don't focus on your weaknesses. Sometimes weakness can raise as big as a mountain. As I say this with my personal experience, yes, the weakness that even each of us fight through every day can be as big as a mountain. But then here God is asking us to take courage. Take courage. Be bold in your weakness. Boast in your weakness. No matter what challenge you're going through, let not that challenge stop you from what God wants you to do. Stop you from the call of God, from fulfilling the purpose of God. Go beyond it. Push yourself to go beyond it. Do not get discouraged because the word of God says, when you're weak, then I'm strong. When you're weak, God can strengthen you in that area. That weakness may become a testimony to glorify God's power. The time when we say, I give up, Lord, is when God shows up just like how he showed up to Moses just front of the Red Sea. Moses never heard or thought that God could part a Red Sea, but then he gave up. He said, Lord, you do it. 
and we see God parting the Red Sea. Not only to Moses, to all his servants, God has been so faithful. They all had their own weaknesses and challenges in their life. There was not one without any weakness or challenge. They were all normal beings like us. And in their weakness, in their challenge, God showed up. That's the reason, uh, 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 like how God strengthened Paul in the scripture verse uh, 9 says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. So each of us, let's take courage, be strengthened in God, in Christ, that we will definitely be an overcomer when we seek God to help us to overcome our weakness, overcome our challenges, overcome the opposition that comes against us. As God was with Paul, so he shall be with each of us. So with that, we will move on. But before that, I saw Lubega raise his hand. Over to Lubega. There is a Bible that I have. It is the Expo Sisters Study Bible which is like saying that the, the difficulties he's mentioning in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, can be traced to, again, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 and 20 to 27. And when I read there, he says, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, a more in labors more abundant, in stripes about measure, in prison more frequently, in death often of the Jews. Five times I received I, I received 40 stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with the rod. Once I was torn, thrice I suffered, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep. Like that, like that. So yes. it actually looks that the man was in, <laughs> was trying to defend himself. He had suffered a lot of things faster. Yes, 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 Brother Lubega. It could be that because uh, Paul writes in one of his letters saying that, I I'm not sure whether it is in this letter, I'm not getting the verse, but then here he says, I bear the marks of Christ. I bear the most of the anyone. I bear the marks of Christ. Yes, um, the persecution that he faced when compared to anyone else was much more. But um, even in the persecution that he faced, God protected him till the appointed time. God was with him. Yes, in when in Acts chapter 14, I guess, uh, where he was stoned to death and he was dragged out of city. We did address when we were studying on the book of Acts on this uh, one area where he was stoned to death. Yes, it was in Acts 14. Yeah, and he was dragged out of city, supposing him to be dead. Yeah, 14 verse 19. See that. And then, however, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city. So here it does not say what did the disciples do gathering around Paul. But then one thing that we all know about is these disciples or the apostles were the men of prayer. So definitely they would have prayed gathering around him. And uh, people those days were very good in stoning. They will stone people to death. Okay, so here we see that he was stoned to death. And then uh, supposing that he is dead, they dragged him out of the city. And then we see all the disciples gathered around him. And next day morning he rose and he went into a different city. See, it does not say that he rested well till he recover. No, a man who's been stoned to death, he would have, uh, you know, he, his body would have uh, had many injuries. But then beyond that, he got up and he walked. Here it, it does not talk about any supernatural healing. But here we see that God raised him. Okay. He was not completely dead. God raised him. And then he moved to carry the gospel for him. Like every minute that he lived on this earth, he must share the gospel. That's what he says. Oh, to me, if I do not share the gospel. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He carried the gospel for him. Every minute costed him that he need to share the word to somebody else. So wherever we see him in the shipwreck, he's been ministering to God. Uh, um, he was rescued. He went to the land of Malta. He, he shared the word of God. And he was in the prison. He shared the word of God. So wherever he is, all that he knows is to share the gospel. So what was in him is what he brought out. 
during difficult times we see one thing continuously out of him is sharing the love of christ sharing the gospel of christ this is something that we need to learn from life of paul and we also see uh, his own life uh, life as a pattern of ministry um so uh, every ministry should be a ministry of uh, as we study this letter it should be a ministry of comfort and deliverance uh, the ministry should also have forgiveness the uh, it should be spirit filled life and faith reconciliation approving a uh, restoration and giving being a blessing to others uh, yes we need to be meekness but even in that meekness we should be yet bold to defend the gospel yes in the ministry we will also um, face suffering humility we need to be humble and we need to discipline ourselves to not give up when the opposition comes or when we go through any persecution we should not give up but then hold on to god god will defend us god will lead us and be strengthened this is what we learn from the gospel i mean from the letter of the corinthians is there anything that you would like to add or share Yes, in this letter we see he shares some uh, more interesting details about his life, a personal experience uh, than in any other letter. In the second Corinthians, he shares the several experiences in the life of Paul that has been found in this letter, where uh, he escaped from Damascus in a basket, and he's been caught up into the third heaven, the revelations that he had, and he also shares some of his personal struggle. that we just discussed and the personal suffering in the ministry he also shares his issues related to gifting and stature he encouraged people uh, uh, you know one of uh, uh, to be a blessing it's blessed uh, it's blessed to to give than to receive you know uh, he he talks about it in this letter uh, he prepares them how uh, offering been made to uh, uh, offering uh, when we give we need to give with a cheerful heart and he collected the offering for the jerusalem church and he also modeled how we need to give giving liberally out of our own property or willingly beyond our ability and he says uh, we need to give to god first he emphasizes on something on giving giving in bondy giving so uh, you know by making yourself poor so that others can be made rich or uh, sowing generously leads to bountiful reaping you know many as such you can talk about you know in in general is overall talking about being generous generously bless the ministry because the lord's work need to continue and we as believers we need to sow what god has given we need to give others that's why god is blessing us to bless others and god is raising us to be a blessing and strongly he believes that and he encourages every believer to be a blessing to the other yeah mm. anyone else would like to share anything add anything first i have a question yes please brother are you read in one one of the books that claims that uh, probably part of the, the just as you say that uh, the the third the letter that he wrote after the first one might have been part of it is found in second corinthians chapter 6 and verse 7 also there is this, a, a a a book that you told me that I was reading and it was like that part of that letter again can also be found in second corinthians chapter 10 and onwards because you, we can see how he changes his tone how he is now doing a lot of apologetics and a lot of authority showing them even what he had kept quiet over all in his letters 
So I don't know your take about that, Pastor. Maybe, Lubega, they may be written many letters, but this is what the scholars say. They have rays of four letters. First one was lost. Second one is what we have as First Corinthians. Third one was lost. And part of third one letter is recorded in the Second Corinthians. So this is what the scholars have said, but not much clearly. So whatever we have has been preserved. So for that, it may minister to us and we may learn what was happening in the Church of Corinthians, how uh, how um, Paul carried the gospel to the place that was full of sin and the opposition that he faced, despite the opposition, how he did not give up, but how the gospel was shared and how he defended his apostleship and how we can uh, uh, go beyond our ability and share the gospel despite the persecution that he faced. He never gave up. There is a lot of learning that we could get, but um, preservation of the letters, we are not sure. Even the scholars are not too sure. So whatever we have received is what is there in the gospel. So what is there is what uh, uh, what is there in First and Second Corinthians is uh, what we have right now. So some say the traces of those lost letters are here, maybe because he is trying to reply to that letter. So in his reply, the tone, uh, the questions that he's trying to answer, the uh, the areas that he's defending, the area that he's personally sharing, because there's uh, there's no continuity from the first letter to the second letter. So they try to say that, yes, the third letter, which was lost, maybe had some questions pertaining to the answer of this letter. Is that OK, Lubeka? Thank you so much, Pastor. Yeah, so. OK, and yes, yeah, so uh, I would like to close this class with a uh, with a word saying that Jesus is the one who comforts us in our suffering, reconciles us to God and gives strength in our weaknesses this is something the essence of this letter that we need to uh, uh, keep in our mind when we remember the letter to corinthians we need to know that jesus is the one who can comfort us the way he comforted paul he is there to comfort us in our sufferings in our persecution and our weaknesses god will be our strength and he is here to reconcile us back to god I would like to end this letter with that. And yes, we can. Is there anyone who would like to add or share something before we could end the session? Or we can get into a time of prayer. Time is up. OK, let's close the session with a word of prayer. Can I request one of you all to please close in prayer? Now can I? Yes, Rosalind, please. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Wonderful Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your goodness, for your mercy. Thank you for this wonderful session that we had. Lord, so many things to learn from your word, Lord. We thank you for this privilege. Though, Lord, th thank you, Lord, as as your word says, Father God, that your grace is sufficient for us, O oh Lord. Yes, Lord, without your grace, we are nothing. We can do nothing, Lord. Father, we ask you, Daddy God, each and every one of us, Father God, let your grace be multiplied in our lives, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Lord, though, may, though we may have many weaknesses in our lives, Lord, but you always remain faithful to us, Father God. Lord, we take our eyes away from you, Father God, at times, Father God, when we are weak, but Father God, we pray today, Lord, give us the grace that we may fix our eyes upon you, O Lord, for everything that we need in our lives. And even to run this race that you have set before us, O Lord, with passion and with endurance, Lord, to fulfill your call upon our lives, Daddy God. Thank you, Lord. Father, like Paul, we too might say that, Daddy God, that when I am weak, then I am strong. Yes, Lord, we are strong in you, yes. Lord God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your strength, for your grace, for your mercy. Also, Lord, I pray, bless the dear pastor, Lord God, anoint her and use her for your glory. 
Lord, she has been a blessing to us, O oh Lord. May she be a blessing to nations. In the name of Jesus, Lord, to, to you we give all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you, Ruslan, for praying. Thank you so much for joining in today's session. God bless. Have a great day. See you all tomorrow with the next book. Thank you. God bless.